address that they are able to speak, as you'll notice the entire panel is black, that they're able to speak in their own voices unmuted. Uh, some of the conversation will be um, harsh or seem harsh, uh, but they are just their realities. And, uh, and I would ask our white listeners and, uh, and um, allies, which, uh, which I use very loosely, uh, to listen and learn and not be offended, to try to hear the, uh, the value in the words as opposed to even the way that they're being said. Okay, so I'd like to uh, hand can off add, to our- Can I add Sorry. one more thing just, just before we move forward? Um, uh, what, what has come out of breaking down racial barriers also is the fact that um, doing those, those 10 weeks with 60 professionals, which we had from across the country represented, um, we've, we're writing a report that basically uh, will be disseminated throughout the industry. And, and what's come from that report is a declaration. And that declaration, um, you know, I'll let Ian dive into the declaration a little bit more, but we're doing an official uh, declaration signing on, on Wednesday. Uh, which we are calling everybody that works in the industry. It doesn't matter if you work for an organization, if you're an individual, if you work for a company, um, that you sign this declaration. Um, Ian, just give a quick little background on what that is. Uh, so the declaration is uh, a seven-point um, summary, basically, of uh, findings that uh, were that will be compiled in the report. The, comp the report is uh, is much more comprehensive, but it's a beginner's guide to um, to things that we need changed in the music industry as black working professionals. Uh, these things are things such as the collection of race-based data. They are things such as um, uh, tracking and public reporting of key metrics um, to basically figure out, you know, percentage of black employees, uh, black people in board positions, etc. Changes and, uh, and uh, realignments to uh, hiring practices, HR departments, uh, concepts like cluster hiring and open hiring, uh, retention and succession tools um, for tracking sources of Black employee drop-off, why are we leaving companies, uh, tools to make sure that, uh, that we can uh, su su uh, succeed. So uh, bringing new Black in, uh, professionals into the industry, things of these sorts. So, so they're, uh, they're listed all on the website, BDRB. Uh, we are doing that in association with SEMA the Canadian Independent Music Association and Advanced Black, uh, Black Canada's new collective uh, for the music industry. And uh, we implore you all to sign the declaration uh, on behalf of your companies and as individuals uh, so that we can uh, get into the deeper work, which is uh, in the report. Um, yeah, and change this industry to make it more equitable. Okay, so off to our guests. Um, if you could each introduce yourselves. Yes, I'll start. Um, my name is Rini Smith. I'm from North Preston, Nova Scotia. Um, I'm a musician, um, songwriter, producer, and performer. Who's up I'll next? Go next. <laughs> My name is Kashmir, born and raised in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Uniac Square to be exact, currently residing in Toronto. I'm a filmmaker, writer, director. Corey Wright, uh, artist, uh, songwriter, um, creative mind all around, trying to learn a little bit of editing and filming as well, trying to follow in the, you know, the big dog there, right? Kaz, right? Like, <laughs> for real. But yeah, I'm just me. Oh. Um, I'm Owen O. Sound Lee, originally from Toronto, but moved to Nova Scotia seven years ago based out of Dartmouth. I'm an artist, musician, and music professional. And Delvana. Hi, I'm Delvana Bernard. No, I'm not Dr. Harvey Miller. Uh, using his account today, and just want to let you know he's not the kind of doctor you can call if you're sick. But uh, so here I am. Yes, yeah, so I'm a former singer, songwriter. Uh, even past ECMA uh, award recipient. And um, for about 20 years, I sang with a group of women, uh, acapella, uh, social justice, lyric singing group called For The Moment. We took our music across Canada and some other interesting places around the world. And um, so with that, um, I think we always used our platform uh, to sort of shine a spotlight on um, history and culture of black music in Nova Scotia. And we always used our music to challenge issues of racism, 
um, wh white male privilege, et cetera, in the music industry. So that's kind of what lands me in the various roles that I've been involved in. And um, I was involved in the uh, establishment of the African Nova Scotia Music Association and really have focused on leaving a legacy of um, community activism in music and black excellence in music. And um, to say that um, currently I'm involved with the um, Music Nova Scotia, sort of uh, co-chairing their diversity committee. Also currently on the board of East Coast Music Association, chairing the African Canadian Committee. And I also participate as a regional representative of Advance, which uh, Click just uh, mentioned. Um, so those are some of my involvements and I even do, um, I guess, a creative, co-creative consulting for the R&B, pop, urban jazz singer, uh, Zamani. So I have a lot of different hats as I come to this industry, into this community that stretch back 30 years and still involve now, but mostly interested in helping to put infrastructure, pave a way and continue laying the foundation for the musicians who are there today, coming behind us, as we say, OGs, as old gangsters. Perfect, perfect. So um, as we have an hour and a half uh, plus questions, we're gonna delve right in. Um, I'm going to start by uh, talking about an over, like having an overview of, um, of anti-black racism and you know just trying to explain to uh, those watching so that uh, they understand in our own words. Uh, if each of the panelists could give me an example of any experience with, uh, with racism that they've had, um, obviously um, the East Coast and uh, specifically Halifax has a very storied history uh, with racism. Anything from a microaggression uh, to, uh, to anything that you'd like to speak of, just so that we could get an understanding and create a base level. Uh, Rina, you wanna try? Sure. Um, for me off, off the bat, you know, just my, my family history, I'm from a historic black community um, and there's been, <laughs> you know, um, many stories that I've heard from my, my folks and my grandparents in terms of how racism has been a plague to our community over the years. Um, me coming up in my generation and, and you know, sort of coming into my own as a musician, um, the stigma about my community has always been something that I've had to fight against, um, always had to kind of use my platform as a way to, to kind of defend a, a community and um, I know for myself, there were a lot of times where I'd be in a situation and people would always bring up events that happened in my community, things they've heard in the media and, and try to place stigma on, on people there and, and kind of almost like use my success as a way to say, well, you know, at least one good person came from there. And, um, you know, for me, it's a slap in the face because I know where I come from. I know the people there and I know that, um, you know, everything that you hear in the media, a lot of it is over-exaggerated. Um, sometimes a lot of the focus is on the wrong things and, you know, it's been something I've always had to worry about. Um, there's also, you know, when when I, I travel out with, with a group sometimes, um, there's also times where I've seen people become intimidated in a way um, as if to, you know, tiptoe around us um, or, or think that maybe could become a dangerous situation. People really uh people really just kind of assume things and um it's disrespectful um it's uncalled for and you know um it's just things that you have to deal with some sometimes and i've definitely definitely had a a, a tough time just trying to maintain my integrity a lot of the time and you know just just for the sake of my own reputation um but you know, these are challenges that, that you have when you come from these historical black communities and people don't understand because they've never been on the inside. They don't know what it's like to grow up there. They only know what they hear in the media and they make their assumptions. And unfortunately, when you're on the other side, when you're coming from the inside, you know, it can definitely take a toll on someone. Perfect. Um, Corey, do you wanna take a shot at this? Um. I'm, I'm kind of the same as Rainy, really. Like, I'm from Uniac Square, and it's, man, you so, like you wake up, you turn the TV on, you see a, a commercial about Nova Scotia. There's no representation of me. Being an artist, 
you go to organizations, you go chat with some of the people, there's really not no representation of me. When, you know, like you go into an office, there's nothing on the walls that I can relate to. And, and, and you have now like the last, you know, year and a half, two years, and I appreciate, you know, people wanting to wake up and stuff, but it's like, we've been screaming this at the top of our lungs for how long? How many artists stopped creating, stopped doing them because of, you know, the situations and things that, that don't happen for us? Like you can just start at the top and go right down the line at every aspect of the music scene. And it's, it's kind of discouraging. That's really all I can really add because Randy summed it all up. Charles? Uh, yeah, I'm, I could give you a, a prime example of, of um, just blatant racism that I've experienced as an artist uh, in Halifax that is probably the prime reason why what pushes me to do what I do and the way that I do it, telling my Black stories from a Black Nova Scotian perspective um, in the areas of industry and film that, that I work in. Um, years ago, I shot a music video in, in, in Halifax, down home, Uniac Square for artist JRDN. He was going by Jordan Crocher at the time. Um, I brought a whole film crew, much music, behind the scenes film crew, television access, media, all this tension um, to our neighborhood. My producer is a white man from Toronto when we flew down to do the video. Uh, when he went to get the um, permits, because we were shooting all outside in Uniac Square, we went to go get the permits from the film permit office. He went alone by himself. Um, and he came back and told me a story about how the white lady that worked at the permit office when she was, was made aware of the location that we were gonna be filming in Uniac Square and he wanted um, permits for that. Uh, she was concerned for this white man's safety. Generally, she tried to deter him from filming there and she had no idea why he would wanna film there. And she thought that he was just a naive white guy from, from Toronto that didn't know that us people, she literally said, well, we don't go there. He said, well, who's we? She says, us, blatantly to his face. And he's like, well, what do you mean, us? She's like, you know, us. And she's like, well, why do you want to shoot there? And he, she, he said, well, the artists and the director are both from that neighborhood. They were born and raised there. And this is where we've come to shoot the video. And he goes, the look on this woman's face. She's like, the shock and amaze that the two artists the, and the music director, the video director were from that neighborhood because she doesn't like Rainy and like... Um, and Corey was saying they don't expect much from us, from the people that come from our neighborhoods. And she couldn't fathom the idea. She automatically knew that we were black just because he said we're from that neighborhood. So to put an artist and a director in that mind state just didn't add up to her. And it wasn't like, it wasn't, you know, this was, we shot this video on film. It wasn't like today's, you know, technology advanced era version of shooting a music video with like, you know, digital cameras. This is a whole film crew, a crew of like 13, 14 people, shooting on film, TV, media, all that stuff. So she couldn't fathom the idea that two black kids from Uniac Square could be working and functioning at such a level. She just couldn't believe it at all. So much so is that she literally was trying to deter this white man from going there because she feared for his, she feared for his safety. Um, and when he came back and told me that story, I was like, you see, this is what I'm talking about. Cause I warned him before, before us coming down from Toronto to shoot the video that he would experience stuff like that. He's white, he's got families that's from Nova Scotia. He's been there plenty of times said, oh, I, I, I know Nova Scotia. And you know what I mean? He's like, I'm from, I work near Regent Park in Toronto. I'm not afraid of anything like that. I'm like, bro, you don't get it, but trust me, you're gonna get it. And that, that one incident, he was like, he couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? Like this is the film office. That is a the permit office. That is a government organization where your only job is to make sure that legally we have insurance and all the legal, legal things that we need for production. It's not your business where we're shooting or why we're shooting there. But she felt so compelled to let this poor white man from Toronto know, listen, don't go there. We don't go there. She literally tried to stop me from doing what I'm doing without even knowing it. Like trying to tell my producer, don't get those permits, go shoot somewhere else, you know? So. Wow. Um, oh, your, uh, your perspectives. Well, that's a lot to take in. Um, I was, I mean, 
I remember just moving here and I was introduced to racial profiling off the rip. I came to Nova Scotia driving my Altima with my tinted windows with my Ontario plates and I was stopped probably three times in one week by the police in that first week that I moved here. And each time I was stopped was, you know, um, oh, you took a sharp, you took a left turn too sharp or, you know, there's a light out or whatever. But the line of questioning between myself and the police officer never had anything to do with what I was being stopped for. It was, where are you coming from? I see your car says you're from Ontario. Are you are you residing here now? What what community do you live in? Um, are you going to North Preston? And it confused me because I didn't understand why each time I was stopped, it was essentially the same line of questioning until it was made known to me that they were trying to link me to, I guess, some type of prostitution ring. And I just found that interesting, you know, and even as an artist coming up in the city, there's been several situations where I do engagements in Halifax or around the area, and you don't get the respect you deserve until they realize you're the artist, you know, until they realize you're the performer, you'll walk in the venue and they'll kind of dismiss you or tell you to go over there or whatever until they see you on stage and by intermission their whole language and their whole body and demeanor changes. Right or doing private functions for mansion parties and they they stuff you in a closet and tell you to stay in there until it's your time to perform a literal closet i'm not just saying that figuratively and it's like. Okay, I could see that the 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 racial discrimination that happens here is very covert it's not in your face it's very cunning so the general public wouldn't be able to see it until you actually isolate the scenarios okay and finally oh gee yes the, oh he is here you know those are very yeah disappointing stories to hear but we all know about it the thing about the music industry is that it doesn't exist separate and apart from the larger society and we know that the uh, East Coast music community is part of experiencing the, the larger realm of racism that ex exists in, in Canada and abroad. So that um, when I think about the various things that have happened in my own life, I can relate to all those stories. Yes, I've been stopped in um, racially profiled, driving while black, arrested, uh, put in a jail cell, all that because a black woman with dreadlocks should not be driving a BMW. Uh, these things happen all the time. So the funny thing about racism, though, and I, I could give you a lot of stories of specific things that have happened in the music industry, right down to the venues and walking through the hallways and, you know, whether it's the event staff or the security staff or the hotel staff who are, you know, watching or coming to your room if they hear a sound, et cetera, whereas someone else can be making plenty of sound, but it's the kind of sound that they're looking for that they want to, that they want to police. Uh, but the funny thing about racism though, is that it's, I always liken it to, to water, H2O, right? Solid, it's a liquid, it's a gas. And depending on the context that you're in, it can take any shape. If it's really cold, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a solid, like an ice cube. If it, it can also be, you know, a liquid like water that we drink and it can be a gas when the steam is coming off your kettle. So to me, when I think about racism in the music industry, it's the very insidious, much more of a gas in the sense that, you know, you could let gas go in a room and everybody's sitting there talking, you can't see it. You can't see it, but it could be poisoning everybody in the room and snuff out your life. Racism is like that. And that's what we call the institutional racism. So for me, my example that I want to offer to your question is around the systemic racism that exists in the music community and music industry in the sense that, I mean, it's very easy to call it. We are off, awfully polite too in the Maritimes. We don't exactly just go up and call someone a name or, you know, just like, you know, call them the n-word or just you know do the kinds of things that you know are reprehensible but we it's really a, a story of exclusion and neglect that's a form of racism too not including people not allowing people to feel like they belong uh, not acknowledging people's culture not allowing people to show up as their authentic self where they have to be somebody else as Rini talked about. And I know I'm from the, the township of, of Preston too in a small community called Lake Loon. But this is what happened. So that what it looks like, what does it look like? It looks like 
you're applying for monies uh, and you have to prove yourself so hard to the funders because they don't believe that, you know, or they don't have an intimate knowledge of the kind of project that you're trying to put forward. You know, so it looks like that. It looks like- so all that. I'm gonna yeah. intervene. I'm gonna intervene because yeah. we're gonna get deep into. You gotta get deep. You gotta get deep. Gonna, but yeah, we're gonna get deep. And those we, and are the only, things. We only yeah. have an hour and a half, and I want to make sure that we get to <laughs> yeah. the real solutions because uh, there are really um, endemic and systemic problems in the East Coast, and we need solutions um, mm -hmm. that are actionable. So let's get into it. So um, the first part of the conversation is going to go exactly where you were going. It is on the economics of anti-black uh, racism and entertainment. We want to talk about gaps in capital funding processes. We wanna talk about examples of how systemic racism looks in funding, um, which is what you were starting to talk about. We wanna talk about core funding versus project-based funding for organizations, suggestions on how to improve or access money and make it more equitable to all artists, et cetera. And then we wanna get into the creatives. We wanna talk about um, you know, the kind of uh, issues that you guys are having uh, financially, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I'm going to start with, uh, with the artists, uh, if the three of you guys could, well, I guess everybody's artists, but, um, uh, the, uh, uh, let's go, let's go Corey. Let's start with Corey and, uh, you know, just give us some, you know, some examples of how racism looks in terms of, you know, like your examples uh, of, you know, your experiences with grant organizations, et cetera. Um, well, for, for me, it was, it was weird because I started applying for grants in like 2015 and, and it wasn't even much, wasn't even big grants I wanted. It was like artist development grants just to, you know, get that artist development. So just kept getting told no, no explanation on what I needed to do. And then I started, you know, just making moves on my own, making moves on my own, just, you know, doing shows and here, putting a, creating product, doing my thing. And as I'm reaching, you know, I'm, you know, stepping up my platforms, getting bigger, growing and growing. And then I applied for an artist development uh, grant one time. And then I was told that I was, I didn't fit it because I was beyond it. And then that kind of, that kind of really messed me up too. And you know, so I was like, okay, cool, whatever, whatever, I'm beyond it, don't need it, got here that far without it, so, you know, showcases come up, apply for showcases, can't, I'm not picked for any of the showcases, still go to these events to show support, still go, going, and all the artists are like, yo, how come you're not performing, how come you're not performing, oh, I don't know, well, you should be up here, like, and then, you know, and you hear that a few times and you get told no a few times with grants and then you're just like, you know what, like, what, I, I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't understand what's going on, but however, I'm just going to do me and keep it moving because I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be whatever. I'm always going to be down the collab, but, you know, and it wasn't until what, last year. I'd say, yeah, January last year, I got my first grant. And like I said, like, I appreciate the, the, the grant, but at the same time, like, am I only getting it so, like, you know, a light doesn't get shown on all the no's and all the, like, everything that was, you know, like, is it, is, is it a hush up type of grant? Like, like, what about the people after me? Or when, if this, you know, this, fed of BLM dies down was it going to go back to normal like you know it's and, and it's and it's it hurts me because I think about like when I was young MCJ and Koji like man like they I just thought they were like the best thing ever and I couldn't like and then, you know, you look into Toronto and I'm seeing like Concrete Mob and I'm seeing Card Now and all these guys like Socrates and like, oh man, like, man, it was just amazing growing up watching this and seeing the support. And then I get older and I hear that they were kind of going through the same stuff, like up there as artists. So it's like, why, if they're going on like that up there, then it, it's worse down here because in Nova Scotia, Halifax, the, the music scene, I feel, my opinion, we're 10 years behind of everything. At least 10, at least 10 years. 
and it and it hurts me because we have so much talent like hip-hop is the number one music in the world rap that most influential biggest marketing biggest dollars behind it but i don't understand how uh, uh, a province can want the revenue but not the growth like yep. it's, it's it's weird to me. Um, yep definitely um and you know like these are these are problems that, that you're speaking about that uh to delvina's point are systemic they're built into systems yeah and uh you know and uh and intrinsically you can't beat a system um, and it's and it's it's a shame though because sorry to, i'm not going to try to take up too much time but it's a shame because there's a lot of allies in the system and they don't like a lot don't even know what's being suppressed from them they don't know like like it's like saying every cop is bad no like the system was designed for us to, uh, uh, designed against us but a lot of people in the system believe it's good and believe it's for everyone but however, the systemic and how it's built, it is not. Yeah, there's flaws in the system. Big. Um, uh, I'm going to go to Rini. Um, Rini, if you can, you know, definitely try to keep, because we don't have a lot of time, so try to keep your, your, your uh, responses. But yeah, if you could share any experiences um, briefly on, uh, you know, financial issues that you might see in the marketplace. All right. Um. From, from my own personal experience, when I was uh, a teenager is when I kind of first started to pr uh, pursue my musical career. Um, I had a very supportive family. My father was kind of behind everything in terms of business and, and, and all that stuff because I was just a kid at the time. Um, and I know starting out um, applying for grants, we weren't successful in, in, in the beginning stages, um, which was to be expected at the time. I know it got to a point where we had to kind of um, really seek external help, um, hiring people to fill things out for us or help us understand the system better. Um, and eventually I did start receiving grants and, and becoming successful, but I noticed a huge gap um, in what I would receive compared to everybody else. So it's kind of piggybacking off what Corey said, you know, was it just some type of hush up type of thing? Okay, let's give somebody some cash so that, you know, they can't say, well, no one's getting any money. Um, I don't have any proof that that's the truth, but it looks very suspicious when <laughs> um, every time you talk to other artists around town, you know, they're having a hard time even, you know, trying to make a decision whether to keep pursuing this because they don't have any support. So um, I know there are definitely a lot of issues there and, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully this will help. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think that it's, it's important what you just said, because the, on top of the, the fact that uh, the way that you feel is anecdotal because we don't have any race-based statistics. That is one of the critical parts of this. The other part of it is that these systems often reward the same people over and over and over. It's the same artist that get the rewards or it's the friendly person who's light-skinned like me or whatever that thing may be, right? And, uh, and I just wanted to toss that in. Um, yeah, I, would, I would like to hear from Kaz for a moment. Um, Kaz, you know, you and me have had discussions and, and especially from a standpoint of building um, infrastructure and mm -hmm. building and building spaces, um, mm -hmm. there's a real need for that. Maybe you could speak a little bit about the challenges that maybe you've seen and faced in regards to that process. Yeah, I was actually going to speak on that based off of Rini and Corey's responses in terms of lack of funding because I sort of sit on both sides of it, right? Like as a filmmaker. I'm applying, if it's music videos, I'm applying for the grants, right, for, for these artists. But I also, as you know, sit on numerous boards um, that are advisory boards for this reason, because um, the, the people aren't getting the grants. You know what I mean? Like Corey was saying, hip hop, and we all know this, number one called number one genre in the world. Hip hop dominates everything and it trickles down. Hip hop is pop culture. You get what I'm saying? And pop culture dominates it all when it comes to the dollars and the cents of this industry. And for me, it makes no sense. And they know they're aware of that, even in, in, in the East Coast, right? Because I sit on advisory boards, I see who gets these grants, and they know that hip hop and urban culture dominates, um, but they're giving them to just the white artists that are, that are doing the, uh, that same genre of music. And, and that makes no sense to me. And a big reason why I notice it is that 
sitting on these advisory boards, I see the grants, I see the applications that come in. And I noticed that there is, like you're asking me, is a lack of resources. There's a big difference in the grants, the applications that I see from the white artists and the applications that I see from the black artists, and particularly in Nova Scotia. Um, which ties into like what Corey was saying, how like at that time artists like, you know, Cardinal said Fish Out Ghetto Concept in Toronto is Black artists experiencing the same thing, but they have one up because there's more resources in Toronto for them. There were programs like Fresh Arts and all those things that were helping them to uh, learn how to be up to par with those, those white artists that have all those resources, whether it's in school or after school or school programs or things like that, that teach them all the other things that come aside from just being the artist and that, that art that you that you present because it's a business at the end of the day you can be someone that sings good or draws good or whatever but if you want to make a living off of that there's the business that goes into that and there is nobody that is teaching the the, the kids in the black communities in in Nova Scotia how to do those things and I know this firsthand because I see it being on the advisory boards and even when I used to do music videos a lot more because I do mostly film and television now, but when I was doing more music videos and applying for all the much fat grants all the time, I would constantly get artists from down home that they were applying for grants, grants and grants and grants and grants, and grants never getting it, never getting it. Then they come uh, to us, my company, not just myself, but either my director or director with our company, RT and our whole company. And most times, right off the bat, first time applying with us, they would get the grant. And a lot of that would just get uh, be due to the fact that we know how to put together proper packages for them. You know what I mean? And that was the missing tool, you get me? And so like what you're saying here is that there's, there's no resources down there for these, for these kids to learn to do anything when we know the talent is there, but there's nobody nourishing that talent for them. But all these white kids in these white neighborhoods are getting that nourishment, whether it be from the schools that they go to, uh, that the programs around them are just, they just naturally have those resources because okay. of the privilege, you know? Sorry, sorry, interrupt, sorry to interrupt you, but if you yeah, can go, go a little further, because one of the areas that, that, that I'd like you to address is the program element. In the program, terms of yeah. building, because I, I know that you, you were involved in trying to bring like Remix, for example, to Halifax mm -hmm. and had some challenges in like, um, Talk about the need of actually having those type of or those type of uh, 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 infrastructure and incubators in that in that in in the East Coast, and what it actually takes to, for those to be sustainable spaces financially, and is the is there you know what are the challenges and obstacles in creating those type of things? I mean, in order for resources like that to sustain, you know, if we're talking. With primarily, I can talk about my experience with the Remix project because you know all throughout my career I, I come down to Halifax, um, and when I speak on panels and things like this, a main question I get asked is how do we get a program like the Remix project in in Nova Scotia, particularly in Halifax? Um, and the main thing I say is that you know the, when we're talking about financing, you know this like the Remix project there's the money comes from two different places there's private you know companies and stuff you know big name companies sony music all that stuff but a large chunk of it all comes from the country itself the government from all sectors municipal provincial and federal and it doesn't work without all three of those you know what i mean it does absolutely i don't care how much money drake from ovo puts in and sony pictures and you know whatever record labels without the municipal the provincial and the federal government remix project would not be able to to exist and sustain the way it is you know what i mean and the reason why it does is because it's toronto you know it's a bigger city so you know it still takes a challenge but the the the, the powers that be in these in these municipalities these, these government organizations understand the need for it you know what i mean that so was so what was the exact challenge that you faced when trying to bring and trying to create some sort of incubation? we couldn't get the money from any of them Okay. Plain and, and simple. And when the first time we brought the first time we brought the remix project down there was what three years ago now, and we were actually supposed to bring it back again last year for a workshop. Um, is that we uh, so RBC Bank gave remix in Toronto this funding because everyone now knows the remix project, the incredible things that can happen when you have programs like this. They gave uh, remix some funding with the initiative to start to um, 
uh, go national because Remix Project is just available in Toronto, right? So um, Remix decided that, you know, start to feel it out, plant seeds. They picked two key cities, Vancouver, Halifax, for main reasons. And we are not going to get into that. Um, basically, RBC said, here's a chunk of money for like to build up. And now you guys have to go to those cities and now get the other monies involved. And the reason they did that is because they knew that, like I said, Remix in Toronto doesn't work without municipal, provincial, and federal. And so we need to go get the same thing here. Um, I got down, went down to Halifax, and I couldn't get money from municipal or provincial, which baffled me because for the past 10 years or so, like I said, at all these panels and things like that, there have been people that represent municipal and provincial that have said that they know that it is needed resources like these type of programs are needed right. in these communities but when it comes time to show and prove everyone's just sitting on their hands like this was there a actual reason given for why you weren't like i want to get to the root of these things of exactly what is given to us we can't just say like oh I yeah know. so here's what here's what the obstacle was okay you guys all this is the era of social media everybody know the spider-man meme the meme where it's a bunch of spider-mans and they're all pointing at each other like this like this, you're Spider-Man, that's exactly what happened. So we go to the municipal um, office and they're like, yes, this is amazing. The Halifax need this. And we see the work Remix Project does. We absolutely need this. Um, let me go talk to this department. This sounds like it's this department's area, right? So they have the money for you. Then we speak to, the, speak to that department. Then be like, no, this is not our, this is not a not department not of whatever, whatever thing. It's a department of yada, yada, okay. yada. Then so that this, department, so, it kept the Spider-Man meme. Yeah, That's why yeah. I say it was literally the Spider-Man meme. And that was thank, thank you for that. Um, I want to go to to Del, Vina, and 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 Owen on this, but I want you guys to 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 keep your answers short, but mm -hmm. also speak more from the spaces that you guys work within. Both of you work with organizations that are there to support black the black artists in the black community. And what are the challenges that you guys have seen working within those organizations and trying to get funding? Um, what obstacles are, exist there? Maybe, oh, you can start. All right, and I'll be very transparent. I'm with the African Nova Scotia Music Association. I was hired three years ago, but the only way I was able to be hired was they applied for a subsidy program through the community Y. And through that subsidy, they were able to bring me on as a full time position because ANZMA itself did not have enough operations funding to sustain uh, a position. So with this subsidy alongside ANZMA, they were able to hire me, the program coordinator. That subsidy ran out one year ago. So what ended up having to happen is I still operate at the same capacity. I'm still in, I'm still doing the work, but I had to take a pay cut in order for the position to continue because we apply for funding every year and typically we get just enough to keep the doors open. Even though ANZMA as an organization has been around for 20 plus years, we've put on numerous showcases and we do so yearly. We host several sessions, several workshops, school tours, and we do so on a yearly basis. We put a lot of artists on stage and give them opportunities per to perform and find opportunities for employment, many who are in this Zoom call right now. But whenever it comes down to applying for funding, we have to prove our viability as an organization. And this is a year, year and every single year we have the same process. And every money that we do get, we try to give back to our community, back to developmental initiatives, back to employing, right? But it's kind of like trying to suck water out of a rock. There's only, only so much funding that we're able to access and we do as much as we can with the funding that we have thankfully i will say that you know cch this year has taken up the torch in a sense and they're they've taken up our challenge to actually try to revamp the organization and have you know kind of started to work journey with us this year to see if there's ways that we could develop and actually turn ANZMA or take ANZMA to a different level. But it has been a bit of a struggle over the past few years. Before we go to Delvina, I wanna say a couple of things there. So this is a call to action. Um, I'm speaking directly into the camera so that you can hear me, federal, provincial and local. Um, there is a, a very, very critical need because what O is talking about is core funding. And I'm sure Delvina is gonna speak about this in a moment. Um, but the other point that I wanna make from what he said is that black people have to make a decision between themselves personally and their community. He had to take a pay cut in order to ensure that the program could continue or 
don't take a pay cut and your community doesn't benefit from it. Novina. Yeah, I mean, really, I, everybody laid it out so well, but clearly it's infrastructure. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. And there are components to that. Let's look at the fact that, you know, we're talking about the skill gaps. Rini spoke about that, having to get the outside assistance. And so did uh, Kashmir talk about helping young people or aspiring musicians to get those grants written. So we, we can't ignore that there is a skill gap. If there's an educational gap in our society, there's gonna be a skill gap when you go to write your grant. So that is something that requires investment. We need investment in the skills so these things you know, can be watered away. And there's a myth that goes around that we keep talking about the, you know, there's so much talent in the maritime, so much talent, but there's also no investment that's happening for people to really uh, master their craft as singers, songwriters, musicians, producers, you know, digital content creators, uh, videographers. So these are all things that we need investment in. There's all kinds of investments out there, but we're not getting our fair share. We, there's also- Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, yeah. but I want you to speak specifically to what those investments are. Are they incubators? Are they outreach? What is it specifically, specifically, specifically that you want? Well, I want to, I want to speak to the fact that government, so the, the gaps are critical because one of the things that I think that we, we must do is we can't speak about the music industry as if it's a thing unto itself. We have to look at the fact that it, it, it really sits inside of the larger society and what music means and what black music, what all music means, because it's not just a commodity for sale. We can't talk about just the industry. We have to talk about the music community and what music does in the largest society. White folk know this. This is why they put money into these things because they know that their history, that their culture, that their Eurocentric way of seeing the world will be furthered and perpetuated by putting money into their music and that it maintains them always in their state of supremacy. We have to understand that we're not just losing opportunities to perform or sing or do these things, we're losing our history because music is not just a product. It's a way of reproducing our culture. And it, it's a way of transmitting our values, transmitting our spiritual practices, transmitting who we are. It tells stories when words can't speak. Music has traditionally done that from the cradle to the grave. So that being the case, I think it's really critical to emphasize these kinds of elements too. So government support is really not just not supporting a musician for an incubator program or this kind of program. It's basically saying we don't support your culture because music is a vehicle for transferring our culture. And that is the fundamental thing that I want to bring to this conversation that I think when we talk about music as an industry product, we leave out. That we're leaving out the fact that the government is saying to us, your culture is not worth supporting. We're not going to give you money to further who you are, to show your identity. These are really critical. So on that front, on that front, I'll but, say this. But, but it's inter I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I have to say something here. Our culture dictates all cultures. So the, the, the messed up thing that happens in a music, especially from a music, music industry standpoint, is that our culture is pop culture. This is not a segmented niche thing anymore. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, so yes. And what is you, also you can't you can't go you you can't go and start funding all these other people that aren't from the black community. That's that right. Are, the appropriation. That are living, that, that are living our culture without us having a control of that culture. Because then well, what does that what does that do? Yeah, not not for not for us without us, and and exactly. also for us by us. And on that front. I will say this uh, click is that the lack of government support by the funding organizations uh, really is what keeps our music community from growing. It absolutely is. And in fact, when I think of advance, advance is probably in my whole 30 years of being involved is the only example I've seen that defies the way government has neglected and worked with the black community because they would rather give money to someone else than to us to develop ourselves. If they don't believe that it's for us by us, so that every time we want to go and seek funding, we have to do a major song and tap dance to convince them that we know what we need for our community. There's been a complete history of a lack of support and funding. And even the funding that we get and are going to be getting is nowhere near, nowhere near what is needed 
-hmm. nowhere near what other organizations are getting. So I, I really point out the fact that the cultural departments within this province, and I'm, I can't even speak about the other provinces where the black community is so small, whether they've even put things together, that they don't trust us, that they do not trust the African Nova Scotian community, I'm speaking largely from the location here in Nova Scotia, to be able to run an organization and have the legs underneath organizations like the African Nova Scotia Music Association should not have existed for all 25 years with no core funding. And I won't, I won't stand on a, on a soapbox and, and give all kinds of praises that some money is gonna come now because I think that that would inflate the, the, you know, what has been done. To be quite frankly, I think that we are taxpayers. This is not someone, this is not a foundation giving us a handout, a hand up. This is a government organization. And the last time I checked, no one was exempt from paying taxes. So this is really critical. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta move Delvina, Delvina. We gotta move on or else we're gonna lose entire topics. Um, but to Delvina's point, um, the black community needs an opportunity to fail the way that white people get to fail all the time. Um, you need to trust them with the, with the funds. And, uh, and, you know, um, Kaz, you want to jump? I think you were, is your hand up? Yeah, no, I just, I'm agreeing with you saying yeah. that you got to trust them to fail. The, yeah. How many, how many white companies they give them money to that have failed? You know what I mean? Like tons of them, you know? And, and, you know, I, I have love for the Remix project, but um, black run and black serving organizations, but especially black run organizations um, need to be the, the, uh, the course of action. We can't, um, you know, having conversations about the community without the community is, is, is fruitless. Um, okay, let's, let's jump into part two. Let's talk about part, uh, part two. Let's talk about um, anti-Black racism in the media and the effect that it has on you guys. The misrepresentation biases, we're going to go through this super quick because we all know what it is, but we need to say it out loud. And, um, and this is specifically in the East Coast. In the East Coast. And I want to reiterate that many of the panelists here are from Halifax, but these problems are systemic and so they 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 are um, reflected throughout the coast. Um, you know, how do we get here? Is it representation in the media? Uh, systemics, I mean, obviously we have a history in Halifax and in the in the East going back to the 1600s. Um, you know, do we need people on TV? Do we need people behind pr uh, producers, uh, journalists, etc.? What is the what are the gaps out there in the media? Can, can we start with ask the question? It, do all of you see yourself in the media in the East Coast? Is there journalists? Is there radio announcers? Is there people that own any publications that are Black? Can anybody speak about that? I can actually. Um, it's starting to change. Um, for instance, recently the CBC has implemented a Black unit. This is post-George Floyd changes, of course, with four people assigned to gather stories that are put on the CBC site as either both their radio and also on their TV and on their website. Uh, that's a first start. But in terms of entertainment media, which is largely the Coast magazine, they do cover Black folk, but there aren't that many Black journalists. And there is a skill shortage. You know, in fact, right now, Black community is in a, a dire situation that there's so much of a demand to try to have Black people present in various organizations. We do not have the, the, the inventory, pool of inventory of human resources to even fill that. But um, there are more and more stories coming. But yes, do the negative stories get to outweigh the positive ones? Or do they get uh, expanded and uh, uh, exaggerated? over the good stories, yes, you'll find a footnote of a good story, you know, big spread for the bad stories. That is unfortunate and that is real. And then that colors how the music industry responds to, to people as well. Um, so to that point, I wanna ask about decision makers, but Corey, I wanna to jump to you and I wanna ask you what, um, how do you see yourself portrayed, um, especially as somebody from a certain area in the media in the East Coast? Um. See, right now, I feel it's kind of like borderline with all the awareness and stuff. I feel like people are, are, are starting to see me, not all, but, but some people are starting to see me as, like, as a person and not just like a, a melanin-based problem. But uh, to your question, like you got Kaya Sparks, 
you got a few people like doing media, but like the anchors, you look on CTV, you look on, you know, like the radio stations. When you you start at wherever the radio station, you know, this the scanner starts, what, 88 something or wherever it starts and you work your way all the way up. There is not one station that's that we can go put it on and that's our heartbeat. There's not one station, but you have numerous whatever, like I said earlier, the commercials, whatever, but that's why, you know, me and a few of the artists and, you know, promoters and other collectives are putting together a collective Atlantic Canada Music Collective and it's going to be focused on the hip hop culture and other genres and stuff that are getting left behind that are not being, man, sorry, this, this, it's really a touchy subject, bro, because like, you know what I mean? I just think about all the times told no, which made me fuel, fueled my hunger. You know what yep. I mean? It fueled yep. my hunger because I'm not taking no no's. It's like, no, it's, uh, a no to me just means, okay, not a yes right now. So yep. we're going to build our own. I don't like, yep. like I said at an interview before, we don't want to sit at the table no more. We're building our own table. We're building our own table. We're building our own building. We, Andre, we, we, Andre we just, can I just jump in for one moment to say that one of the things that you have to keep in mind too is that we can't just be pulled off of the street and put a microphone under us and become people who can report on what's happening in the Black community. People wow. who have these jobs, they've gone to journalism school, broadcasting school, communication school. So it all goes back to that we have to do the investment early in to be able to like, you know, when, when government, when we say things like we want to send, we want Canada to be able to send a soccer team to the World Cup. Well, we start thinking 10 years back to say, start promoting soccer in communities and, and these kinds of things. You know, people just don't magically appear because of their talent to be able to take up these roles. Someone had to invest in them a way back. When we see all the music that's, that's actually blossoming in, Mar in, in the Maritimes right now, it's because when they introduced the various school music programs, first starting out in places like Truro with band and these kinds of things, people got to learn to play the instruments, read the music and do these things. But I tell you, I go to these concerts for, with nieces and nephews and so forth. There'll be like one black kid in the band, one black kid in the choir. So then that, what does that mean? You can't sight sing, you can't read music. When, pe when, jo when, gotcha. when, when, when musicians come here from other places and they say, I need to pick up a black player, like, they can't read music. They can't, gotcha. you know, people like gotcha. Owen who can are so busy because he knows that there are people who can play just as good as him and you put a sheet music in front of them and they can't get the job. Got it, got it. And, um, and Corey made an interesting point that I just really want to emphasize to to the listeners as well. He's building a collective. Um, Not me, we. Yeah, there's well, a, there's we are, a team we're of built, us. Yeah, we are, we're building a, a team collective. There's a, collect yeah. there's a collective <laughs> being built, sorry. Um, there can be more than one Black organization, one more than one Black collective. It is not a zero-sum game, and we're not fighting each other. There are very, exactly. very, very different perspectives as as black people we have we are not homo homogeneous right Kaz might think something different than Owen we are all in the same um fight though right and you know Corey might be hip-hop and you know Delvina might be gospel and Remy might be R&B but those things can coexist don't just fund one fund all and start uh to Delvina's words early oh can, sorry question can, oh, oh can either o or arena or even cash like um i really wanted to just circle back to the the media aspect and why it's why do you guys feel it's important that somebody who looks like you covers your story as an artist or like like how, is it important um i just i just want to say this is where institutional racism is very strong because till divina's point a lot of these people who are in these positions of media got there out of school they got they got the training they networked they communicated with people within their programs and these people gave them the launch to get into cbc to get into ctv or to get into wherever they are today the problem where, where that becomes a problem for us as black artists is majority of black artists aren't going to the post-secondary schools. They're learning how to play their instruments 
at church. They're learning, you know, maybe they had an instrument lying around their house. So they learn by ear and this is how they perfect their craft, but it doesn't translate well in the post-secondary department where they don't consider you a musician until you learn how to read music and how you, until you learn how to write music or maybe dealing with journalism specific skills that you learn in the classroom. So when you try to apply for these jobs that you are tangibly capable of doing, they will still tell you that you're not allowed or not capable of filling these positions because you don't possess certain skill sets or traits that they expect you to learn in a post-secondary education or institution. So we don't we don't get the opportunity to pursue music as a full-time career. And many people don't think it's possible because they don't funnel through that same institutional line that we're expected to. I just want to circle back to my question. Um, my question was more aligned in regards to media. Like when you talk about t being on the radio, if you talk about getting covered in a newspaper or in a magazine in the East Coast, if what you're telling me there's a lack of Black people in those spaces, is that a problem for you, Rena? Like having your story, what the songs you write about, the stories that you're singing about, does it matter to you? Do you feel like your story and your, your, your branding of who you are and what you're trying to tell and how you want to be perceived is properly being um, covered? Um, I think it is being properly covered only because I make sure that I speak clearly about who I am as a person and how that relates to me as an artist. I've done interviews and media segments with Black people and and also white people. What I can say is that there definitely is a difference in the way that I feel that it comes across. Um, just, you know, when I'm in an interview, I want it to be more conversational. I don't want it to be like, you know, you have a list of questions and you just ask me based on what you want to know. I want it to be more conversational. If you ask me an initial question, I want to rebut and give you my answer, but I also want you to base it off of what I said. Like next question should come from that. I want it to be real conversational. And I noticed that it's usually more so like that when I'm with um, someone who's black because, you know, they want the whole story. It's not just about, oh, you know, when did you start singing? Well, everyone knows I started singing in church. That's that's a given. Um, you know, oh, well, talk about your musical family. Okay, we already know that the Smith family in Nova Scotia has a musical legacy. We already know this stuff. It's always the same things. You know, me as a person and as an artist, I, I go much deeper than what people already know about me, already assume. Uh, it, it's it's really annoying sometimes to really get those same type of questions. So I always make sure that, you know, I put out the narrative that I want. And also just to piggyback on what everyone else was talking about a little bit, I did uh, a short documentary for a university student as a part of her final project. Um, and she told me a story about her first month at school, how she almost dropped out of the program because her professor told her that she doesn't think journalism is something that she, sh she should pursue because she didn't feel the way that she told stories would be successful in that <laughs> in that field. And so she's one month in and her, her professor already tells her, you know, you shouldn't be you shouldn't pursue journalism. So that those are some of the obstacle obstacles right there that people are facing, which also in turn makes it hard for us to get our stories portrayed properly because they don't want to hear how we tell our stories. They're so, telling us from the school. Yeah. You know, you're not doing it the way we want you to do it. We, we uh, actually, great point. We got to jump on. Um, but um, to that point, I think it's critical that we have uh, people in decision making, uh, which is the question that I was kind of getting to in terms of um, people who can green light a story in the first place and ensure that the our narrative is told the way that we need it told. Um, you speaking well in your interviews is incredible. Um, but if they have a narrative behind the scenes or they they have a narrative before the story that they even pitch, we have a problem. All right, we're gonna move and, on. And, and, and to, to, to echo what you're just saying in regards to narrative is like, there's a, there's, a, there's a different connection to understanding when you're a black person versus somebody else who's not a black person. And there's, there's more at stake when you're like, okay, this is my radio show. I'm here to like put my community on. This is, I'm writing for this magazine because I'm gonna put my community on. Um, and, and when we're not in those spaces, um, sometimes it's the narrative that is being pitched is negative. We oh, all know wait. this, on you know? Your, on your media point, let me just say this one thing, that the mindset in the media 
sadly has to grow beyond the respectability politics and exceptional exceptionalness politics so that the the owens the reenies you know whomever the gospel is or even whomever it's it's always been oh wow you're such an exception mm -hmm. oh wow you're such a respectable person and tell me like how did you come up out of your dire situation to make it to this yeah so mm -hmm. you know so it's an exoticizing yep. Yep. you yep. know what i mean and yep. fetish fetishness yep. Yep. and yep. that mindset it's a form of racism also. Exactly, exactly. It basically says, there, you guys did something, there's no others like you, you guys did something exceptional. <laughs> well, we could probably go home and get 10 other people just like us, right? But, and they wouldn't believe it. So that is also the problem with how the media portrays, which is why Rini is so correct to say, stop giving me the shallow questions, right? <laughs> I'm deeper than that. Talk to me about my creative process. Talk to me about my ideas of the world. Cause like as musicians are, are people who have traditionally have had a profound impact on changing social ideas. Talk to Rini about that, because I'm sure she'll tell you. So this is what we have to challenge the media to do, to stop putting Black musicians in a box that they are an exception to their race. And we know that, that'll, because it's just basically an updating of exception to your race kind of mindset. Yeah, yes. and, thank, yeah, yeah, thank you. One, one, the next area that we're gonna talk on um, is a very important area because as we all know, um, COVID, COVID and the corona world has, has put the live industry upside down, but it's still a very important area to talk about because it's a livelihood. It's one of the most important areas of the music business is to, to be, you know, to be on stage and do shows. But it can be very challenging if there's uh, obstacles put in front of you to even get a show or to do a show. So, you know, we'd love to dive into this conversation in regards to... Um, you know, what type of prejudices and racism are based on the audiences, the music genres, um, you know, feeling unwelcomed in establishments, um, representation or lack of managers or owners or promoters in these spaces to help make live even exist. Is there actual stagehands, roadies, all the different people that, ex that exist to make a live show work? Do they exist in the East Coast first and foremost? Somebody want to answer that? They want the artists to come, but they don't want the artists to bring their fans. It's kind of very much the same way as like, you, they want to play our music in the clubs downtown, but they don't want the black people to come in to listen to their own music, right? Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and why is that? Uh, this, oh, oh, we're too loud. Um, we don't drink enough. Uh, so it's not good for their, their, their bottom line. These are all the stereotypes, you know, that come with having a black uh, patronage in these establishments for live music. Uh, there's also the, you know, historical fears of black people, white folk not feeling safe in the presence of too many of us in number. These are all the stereotypes that are there. That is changing significantly, we know. And there are many people asking who want to do better, who are trying to do better, asking us, to help them to do better. And a lot of the times they're, you know, sort of lone soldiers, but, and I think we are gonna get there, but in the meantime, and they're also sometimes those people who are reaching out are afraid that if they take a risk and it doesn't go well, that then they get negatively sanctioned by their peers and say, I told you not to have those folk. Uh, Owen, Corey, and, and Rena, have either of you had any challenges in trying to hold your own shows? Um, you know, outside of your like community, like trying to bring stuff to a larger audience, like trying to book a venue or doing those type of things. Is there obstacles there? Or is it pretty easy? Uh, no, huge obstacles. It, it, it's like I said now, like it's probably easier because people are becoming more aware, more woke and the allies are really like, you know, they're really here. And it's like, you know what? I'm not racist. I didn't know I was doing that racist behavior. I was ignorant, but now I'm here. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to share, you know, my platform, whatnot. But yeah, before all, like before this, yeah, like, bro, I would uh, go try to book a, sh book, like book a venue to, to put a show on. And then they tell me no. So I'll be like, all right, cool. But then I get my, my, my Caucasian buddy, to go book the show and it's booked and 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 that's how we did it for a few venues and a few venues like you know like sometimes they would i'd get the answer like oh we don't do hip-hop here all right cool 
and then I'd send my buddy in. Mm. Which which is which is crazy because hip hop is so huge. You one hundred percent. It's the biggest thing in the world. 100%. And I guarantee you, whoever owns that venue can't tell me they don't know a lyric to a rap song. I guarantee you, a rap, if a Jay Z song comes on, or if they're in their car, I guarantee you they rap it along. You yeah, know what I mean? 100%. So there's definitely a blatant racist there. Rini and, and O, can you speak about the festivals? Um, trying to get into festivals, and when you are accepted or performing at festivals, what are some of the the I guess you could say systematic and and blatant racist things that are happening that are, are stopping you from being the best you can be as an artist. Okay, I was going to say if Rudy wanted to go first. Um, yeah, sure. I could speak from Anzma's perspective. You know, I'm going to echo what Corey is saying. With this whole wave of, you know, racial reconciliation happening within the media, you see a lot of a lot of people taking a reactionary approach where it's like, okay, well, this is a problem that we have to address before it gets too out of control but prior to this whole season you know even things like when ansma we do our black vibe showcase in partnership with the ecmas and with music nova scotia twice a year and and for a long time it kind of felt like we were a separate entity from the actual conference itself even though the black vibe showcase is a showcase that happens during these conferences we would have to book our own venues we would have to find our own accommodations we would have to pay the artists out of our own pockets it was never an actual collaborative in that sense it was more so it just Hap just so happened to have a concurrent happening with these conferences, but it definitely has changed over the past couple of years, but this has been a history within the African Nova Scotia Music Association for a little while now. I will say that. Um, yeah, I'd say for me, just being in the festival scene, most of the times when I'm on a show, I'm like 95% of the time, the only black act on a specific night. Um, and you know, at the same time, you can see tons of folk artists on the same show, um, country acts all all on the same show, um, and it's kind of like they've boxed us all into like a group. Black music is black music, and then everybody else has different genres and all this different stuff. Like it makes no sense. Um, <laughs> how many times I've gone to shows and it's like, okay, maybe they'll have one one black person up there to represent all of black people when I, I know black people are doing country music. I know black people are doing pop people are doing whatever genre, but it's like one of us gets to represent all of us. Um, and I've, I've been that victim of tokenism plenty of times, more times than I care to recount. Um, and I think that's a huge thing with these festivals. Um, it's, it's, it's that whole type of, you know, let's keep them quiet. Let's invite somebody so that we can keep the rest quiet. Um, and it's lumping us all in, assuming that, uh, black people are one thing and um, you know that's definitely something that that I've I've noticed and and also for myself personally I've been told many times like you know here, here's an offer for you here um, it's probably not a show where you can kind of do what you really want to do for me that would be like bringing my band and having it be in a real musical experience so like yeah maybe just you at the keyboard or or maybe you and a couple singers do a more of a, an ac acoustic show because maybe maybe they'll accept that more. Um, I've been to shows where they've actually been like, hey, do you guys mind playing a little a little softer or turning the volume down because, you know, some people don't like loud music? Why the hell did you hire me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, why am, I, why, why am I here? Why am I here? I'm the one providing the art. You don't get to tell me how to do my job, you know? I actually, actually, actually want to dovetail off of that. And I want to talk about um, palatable blackness. Um, and I want to go to Corey and Rini. Um, you know, you, you spoke about like genres. Are there genres that are more palatable than other genres to, um, to the audiences, quote unquote, uh, that be out there? And Corey, a uh, specific question to you um, on the success of black uh, Hip hop artists versus your white, because there are tons of white hip hop artists, whom, many of whom we love, uh, but out there, um, do you see a difference in the treatment? Uh yeah, and and I don't think the the treatment, no, maybe maybe it could be deliberately, but uh, maybe not. It's just like if you have a white artist and you have a black art, a bl rapper, so you have a white rapper, a black rapper, okay white rapper speaks his truth well you know per capita there's more white people here that so they'll just 
gravitate towards the white rapper. He's speaking his truth or she's speaking her truth. Oh, they can relate on more of a relatable level just because, you know, every, just because, just because. Now, if I speak my truth, growing up in Uniac Square, all the struggles I've been through, this and that, all the obstacles I faced, all, all the things I've overcome, I'm not going to get that same reaction because a lot of the white people that, the, a lot of white listeners might not even uh, pick, if I was a CD, pick up my CD. You know what I mean? They're like, uh, he's probably a gangster rapper or, you know what I mean? Like, and it's just, that's- But they would listen to it if he was a big name artist from the US though, same one, story. 100%. Same story, same living, but he was a, a label signed artist from Atlanta and had a track with the Migos on it. They would play it over and over and over and over again. 100%. So, Thank you, Cass, for that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, before we jump out, I just have another quick question. Um, you know, these festivals. I, I in my in my travels uh, across the uh, research thing, you guys have a lot of festivals. A lot of festivals. Are black artists being hired on these other festivals that are not just the jazz festival or the this festival? You guys have probably challenging Toronto for the most festivals I've ever seen in a space lobster festival this that festival are black artists being 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 hired on these festivals cover bands are being hired you know if you're, if you're a black cover band and you're right music then yeah you'll definitely get hired to the lobster fest or you know down digby or whatnot so that you can sing a bunch of marvin gay stuff and stevie wonder but they're not gonna let you come in and and you know do a hip hop set or do a rap set like it, it's really it, it goes right back to I think I heard someone mention tokenism and basically palatable black music like they want to a lot of these festivals want to feel good they want they want the type of music that like they could leave and not feel guilty about but when you start getting into certain other genres they really will shy away from that one of the other points that uh, can't be ignored is that Sometimes racism isn't the sole uh, motivator, that sometimes it's about racism versus economic nepotism. So like you in a small community where the economic base is small and someone's programming a festival or a concert, it's like, oh, let me hook up my fourth cousin from Mabu or, or from you know this place or that place. And they're just doing the old boys network more than and then when you when you use that kind of way to screen who gets into a festival or into a venue, and then you start to look at who's on the lineup, then you realize that, oops, I contacted all the people I know. And if you only know people like you, then that's who's going to get programmed on the event. And so then if you ask those folks, did you think race was a consideration? Well, I'm not racist. I just picked the people that I knew. So that happens a lot more than we realize. And I agree that um, we do have this whole palatable you know, uh, aspect that is present. And, and yes, the Elvis complex does still happen and the Justin Bieber thing still does happen that I've gone to many events at, and showcases, et cetera, where like, you know, most of the rappers are, are I mean, the cultural appropriation of our, of our art and of our style. And that is oh. mostly these young white guys from who are making beats in their parents' basement and they're coming out and they're having their ciphers and this, and this is gets supported and funded big time. And like, this is, I can think of so many young, I went online the other day, I'll just say this, and look, this young fella named Kiki Beats, who is a part of the CBC Media Project, who makes a lot of videos for, and he's from North Preston. Yep. So a lot of videos for the young hip hop people. He's and, here right now. Oh, oh okay, okay Kiki, here. shout out to Kiki, because he does fantastic work. And I went on his website and I, and I looked at all the videos he made. I said, who are these people? all these young people that were doing stuff that why aren't they at showcases and so forth so there's all kinds of them and there's like young white folk who are probably no more skilled at the craft of hip hop of of, of spitting rhymes who are you know are being funded to go to these cyphers and so forth and part of that too though is also the not is the gap around social engagement that a lot of black folk don't feel like they belong in these spaces and they don't they don't go to participate in these spaces and they don't get invited into these spaces so there is that whole whole thing that goes on i'll tell you the funny story 
of a friend of mine. I went to university. We don't have a lot. We don't have a lot of time for it. <laughs> I know. We don't, we don't, no, okay. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to cut you off right now. <laughs> You yeah, know, no, we, he had a, he had a, he had a record. He said his, his grandmother kept the Charlie Pride record, no, I loved it, but would not take it over the, over the album cover. Okay. Cause you didn't want to see the face. That's what's happening to our people. They don't want to see our face. They want to hear the sound. I hear you. Got it. We, we have um, you got to tell a story to get your point. We have yeah, we got to, we got left and we really tie it off. Tighten, it, tighten um, it up now. Quick, quick point of information. All of these musics that you're talking about, cause we're talking about palatable black musics. Most of these forms are black music from rock all the way back. If you go to EDM, hip hop, jazz, folk, these are all black music forms just for the record. Uh, Google is there for you. We won't go any further on that. Uh, representation. Um, there's a need for representation on the boards of these festivals. Um, take a look at your, uh, at your board lineup. If you have 12 people, look around the place. If you don't see any black people, you need to get on that immediately. Okay, let's move. Click. Um, I, I guess the next space is, uh, you know, Kaz, um, being, you know, especially somebody who has the awards and accolades underneath your belt and have done some really amazing stuff. Um, how, what, what is, what do you see in terms of the creative space? Like, you know, with directors, editors, graphic designers, like, are, are they being heard and seen in the East coast? Are they getting the, the skills? Are they getting the, um, the, the fine, like, are they getting everything needed to support their craft? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No, they're not. Um, they're learning, but they're learning on their own. You know, like kids, like cats, like can't even call Kiki kid no more because he's been doing this thing for years now. But he's still gonna be little bro to me always. But Kiki learned on his own. You know what I mean? He's he's self taught. You know, and he do things like when I would come down when he knew I was in town filming, he'd come be by my side. Like you know, there's a lot of cats out there like Kiki that have just been doing it themselves. But um, but they 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 need more resources plain and simple you know what i mean they need what, like what those resources hey, example, look like it's anything anything in the arts like for example i'm 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 in the process of doing my first feature film it will be shot in halifax it is based in halifax the cast is all black except for the cops okay and it's a young cast i want to cast locally because i don't want my film to be no disrespect to my fans that did the movie, but across the line where it was a movie set in Scotia, but the people sounded like they were from Toronto or from Jamaica. You know what I mean? It don't make no sense to me because that doesn't happen in other black films. If you watch a black film about Jamaican Canadian culture, they got Jamaican Canadian accents. You know what I mean? You can't it, make it a actually, film. It about... actually it actually does happen because they they always cast Americans, but I Americans they cast Americans, <laughs> but they at least try to teach the Americans the dialect, right? They're saying all the Jamaican slang and stuff like that. Dude, anger cross the line. You don't see none of that. You know what I mean? My point is, I want to I want it to be as authentic as possible. My challenge is. It's a young, the main cast is all kids, teenagers. I don't, there's no teenagers down there that, that I know they can act, but they don't know they can act. You know what I mean? Because there's no resources down there to do that. And, and so my challenge is, what do I do? Do I, like, like, um, like Ian was just saying, hire a bunch of American actors and try to teach them a Scotia accent which like they did and across the line, that's not what I'm, that what I want to do. And I'm obviously not, my plan is I'm going to put on a bunch of acting workshops. You know what I mean? Because there's a lack of resource down there. So I'm basically killing two birds with one stone. And we're supposed to actually start doing it last year and this year, but pandemic. So it's being shifted, right? But I'm going to put on a series of acting workshops where I'm bringing down Black actors from Canada and the States to do workshops and provide a, a needed resource but also see what kids got some talent. And I'll probably at least find half my cats from these things. Cause like we said, the common theme here is we know that the black Nova Scotian community has talent, immense amount of talent. It's just not being nourished. And why it's not being nourished? Cause they're not providing the resources for them to, to do it. So they don't even know that they can do it. Plain and simple. You know what I mean? All, all, but, all, panel, one, all, all panelists, sorry, click, go ahead. One thing I just, I just wanted to add to that mm -hmm. is you know, and this is me speaking, you know, to everybody watching is um, you, you might be hearing a lot of things right now that are, are very like, OK, we don't have this, we don't have that. But you have to look into the deeper conversation here. Mm -hmm. And one thing you have to realize is this. Black culture makes money. I was so, going to say that. So, so, so right by now. putting resources and putting your support into the black communities in the East Coast, throughout the East Coast, 
will bring more economics back. But to that's that. the deeper issue. They, they, I'm just going to be real. They hate us so much that they'll even allow it to affect their pockets. And if there's one thing that history has shown us that white people love is money. Okay. <laughs> and they hate us that much that they will literally allow it to affect their pockets. It doesn't make any sense other than you don't like us. Plain and simple. And, and you have and, no and interest. And, and you and have that, no interest in bringing us along. You know what and, I'm saying? And, that, and like, that's the and that's the blatant racism that exists. That is the blatant here. racism. And, and, and what I'm speaking to and who I'm speaking to in this space right now is individuals that actually want to make a difference and change mm -hmm. in a more equitable and diverse uh, society that you want to live in. So if you want to be in the music industry and you want to be in the entertainment industry and you have and you and you and you don't see uh uh you know you're not you don't you consider yourself not to be a racist individual then this is the time to actually step up and look at the challenges that you're hearing today and actually step up and actually make changes and open up doors for the things that were that you're hearing need to be um changed and and um i just i just want to make that statement yeah, this you know, conversation needs to be broadcasted on like something like 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 public broadcasting. You know what I mean? Where people are forced <laughs> to listen because I, we have, as far we have as no I know, most of the white people in here, there. <laughs> most of the white people I know in here are those people that we're talking about, and they're already doing the work. You know what I mean? Like DJ IV in here, and he's been trying to get a, a incubator like the Remix Project um, off the ground in Halifax for a couple years now. He keeps getting denied the money, and he's white. Right. But because he's trying to do it for like I Ivy's an urban DJ, so they just look at oh, but you do that black stuff, you know what I mean? Now nah, we're not interested. But I bet you if Ivy was trying to do a folk music workshop, he'd get all the money. You know what I mean? Well, well, let's move to the next topic, Ian, sure. and, and we'll circle back on how we're gonna fix these solutions. Okay. Um. So <sighs> frustrating. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the artist space. Um, there's a couple, all, all of you guys are artists. Um, let's just talk about the systemic barriers that you guys are facing, the, the lack of infrastructure in terms of like, there, are there record labels out there? Uh, industry associations, uh, what has your experience been with DSPs, with uh, digital service providers, uh, et cetera? Like maybe you could give some insight into uh, what's needed there. Like as an artist, also just being an artist, like I, I was an artist at one point. So I understand like the creative process in your head and in your soul and in your spirit to create art. Um, but when the, all the odds are against you, how can you really be 100% who you and what you want to put out into the world? You know what I mean? And so I would love to hear like, what are those odds that you feel are maybe, you know, obviously not, not, not um, putting out the fire, because, you know, fire's deep in us, you know what I'm saying? But like, you know, what are some of those challenges that are putting it, trying to put out that fire or sometimes just feel like that I can't, you know, how hard it is to be an artist in the East Coast is what I would like to hear. And is there a brain drain? Like, are you guys like f feeling the vibe that you need to leave? Um, I, th I think I'll go. Um... Me being an artist here, I always felt I had to work 10 times harder than everybody else to get noticed initially. And then to keep climbing the ladder, still had to even pile on even more work just to, to make sure that I'm that good that you can't not notice me, that you have to give me space. You have to give me platform. Um, and it's, it's tough because, you know, I don't see music as a competitive thing. To me, it makes no sense for me to see it that way because it's something that gives me inner joy. So when I think about myself in a competitive way and I, I understand my talent and I see other people and they they get more recognition or or you know seems like they're going further. You know, that is that it's it's annoying because I don't have a solid answer as to as as to why, you know, I haven't been afforded some opportunities. And I also personally for myself, it doesn't bother me in a way that causes me to wanna uh, consider my career or not but it's just sometimes you think about that and it's like maybe if I lived somewhere else maybe I would have a better opportunity or or maybe I would get noticed more maybe you know um, I'd be able to, to do to to do a little a little bit more in a different space um, 
I haven't I haven't felt the need to leave. I feel like I, I have work here to do. Um, for me, it's bigger than the music at this point. And you know, I feel like my experiences can kind of kind of help bring bring a shift or a change. That's what I choose to believe about myself anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I I definitely see I definitely see that there's still a lot of challenges to to overcome. And um, I know I know a lot of other people on this panel can attest to that as well. Do you find that um, that the artists coming out of the East Coast are export ready? Like, do you guys need development and, and assistance in becoming uh, export ready? Oh, not everybody that leaves the East Coast is export ready. And I want to kind of loop back to what Corey was alluding on earlier. You know, when he was applying for grants, and they were basically telling him like, "You're not ready." And then he got ready, and all of a sudden, you're too ready. You know, there's this disconnect of <laughs> it, it's. <laughs> Right. It's this, it's this disconnect of here's a ball of talent, but they don't know how to harness this. They don't know how to brand themselves. They don't know how to maybe form form a song or how to produce or how to attain, obtain certain skill sets. And there's no midpoint for them to become export ready. They're left to figure it out themselves. Like Rini is somebody who they built a studio in her house. You understand that she and she she hit the ground running and, and perfected her craft. Same thing with Kiki. He's somebody that had had built studio space in his own house. And what you have are a plethora of artists here that are just trying to figure it out on their own. And because they feel the sting of segregation within their own community, they don't necessarily leave here to chase opportunity all the time. It's more so I don't feel welcome on my grounds. So I wanna go somewhere else where my music is more palatable or my music is received because I don't feel like it's even being received in the home that I'm from. So it's not necessarily that they're always export ready. It's just more so I think I'll have a better shot being elsewhere than on my own turf. Corey? What does export ready even really mean? Most of the times in the Maritimes, it's a group of festivals and showcases that they've um, decided should be on a list to be funded. And sometimes those, those uh, events don't even include our kind of music to the degree that uh, <laughs> it would. So like if we were to generate our own list of black events uh, globally, that, you know, that would really change the game because I know from years ago in my day and watching the younger people today and, and working with an artist who was going to a festival called the Roots and Soul Festival in the Caribbean. It was like, whoo, I, I was told that the application for travel was a squeaker because it was hard for them to believe that what could you what could you possibly get out of going there? I mean like, well, of course, then at the end it was like people like Estelle there. There were people like old old G's like you know, UB40 or all kinds of people. So there were all kinds of contacts made and, and things that happened, but then COVID happened. But I'm just saying export ready is in itself a biased terminology um, that sometimes disenfranchises uh, a lot of black artists. So that's that's a critical point. Thank you. Um, you know, actually, I just want to dovetail Corey. I'm going to uh, let, let you continue this question too. As you speak of festivals and uh, in this time after George Floyd, where um, there are a lot of boxes to check to get grant funding, etc. Do you find that festivals that have not picked up black artists are um, picking up black artists um, all of a sudden tokenistically to uh, to check off boxes and then continue uh, on that path. Uh, yeah, 100%, 100%. And now, like I said before, maybe it could have been because they didn't realize the detrimental, you know, issues that they were like causing from, you know, not being aware of our presence in the music scene. But now, yeah, they're picking it up more and you know it's it's appreciated but at the same time like we need to be on these boards like we've been saying like on the board like in every level of the space we need to have representation so you know the context of the artist it doesn't get lost in translation on the way up the line and but to go go back on um what was the 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 last question i like to touch that really super fast I think it, the question was just more about like what challenges as an artist. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 To be creative. Yeah. And also like, I, I would love for you to maybe speak about this. I don't want to pass it around because we don't have a lot of time, but um, team, 
like how easy it's actually establish a, a black team for yourself out there and team is like a manager a lawyer a, a label like does that how you know how easy is that to even establish that uh that's really extremely super hard because you got it like you know like like uh, Miss, Mrs. Bernard was talking about, like it, it comes back from schooling, like, you know, like we got to go to school to be entertainment lawyers. You know what I mean? Like we got to go to school to want to be that A&R and, you know, and, and you get like, you know, publicists and down here and stuff, but they don't, you know, really mess with our type of music. Right. So it's like, like I had a few sit downs with a few people and they're like, okay, we'll send the song over. And it's a real poppy song, you know? And I had uh, Peter Jackson on it, really like, you know, bubbly, poppy, summertime, whatever. And they're asking me all these generic questions. Okay, well, how does it sound? I sent it to you last week. You didn't even listen to it? Like what? Or we're, have, we're at a meeting right now and you ain't listened to it yet? Oh, well, is there any cursing? No, there's no cursing. Okay, well, if there was, I know, but we're past that. No, so go to the next question. And this is like a series of questions. Like they want to hear a certain amount of no's or yeses before we can even move. Like, like they're gatekeeping to like, it's so weird. But right. uh, like, and that's what I'm saying. Like with ACMC, picture walking into a space and there's artists, there's a bunch of artists over there writing a songwriter's corner we're all helping each other whatnot then you got musicians over and the next side or over in the next floor you have a studio kiki's up there teaching youngins how to make beats cats there doing videos here how to do videography all that like we need a space center. yes we, we need, need space. a space yeah so that's um, where i was going the, Beautiful. The, 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 the last question i have is more around like the idea of um Met, like having somebody in your corner to to really represent you to open up the doors be it a label like is there a black is there any labels that are not like an artist themselves is there any is there an is even like a black run label out of the east coast that anybody in this room actually knows about there isn't there isn't mm -hmm. a, at all i mean i think that mark perry who was is also another og did but you know, try to do a compilation project of um, a group of uh, hip hop artists back a while back, you know, a long time ago. With that, you know, monies were even harder then to get now, and so imagine what that could have grown into, and, and it didn't. But essentially, because um, this is the last question, um, I really like what you said, both of you, that for the funders who are listening, because they always take black organizations and black folks and put them in one basket there's nothing wrong with funding in an, an, an og group like ansma and at the same time funding uh what's happening with younger younger ideas with people with like what corey is doing instead of saying oh why can't you guys just get it together so we can just fund one i don't think that's fair because the needs are different it's like saying like forcing the blues association to have to go in with the jazz association or the or the Celtic association or whomever. So I think that that's really important. And then the last thing I'm just gonna say is the answer to all this, these barriers is investment, investment, investment. We need to invest in the infrastructure, give the money so that we can have a sector strategy and that sector strategy should include the work that Corey is doing, should include the work that ANSM is doing, should include all of these things around artist development, invest in artist development, invest in uh, music business skills that we talked about that we need to have. So we can have the, eventually all the people who can do be agents, our a and R people in these. And lastly, and the mentorships and existing organizations must change and expand their governance and programs to remove the systemic barriers. And uh, I know we are talking to the converted on this call, unfortunately, but talking to the choir, the people on here but, are but, already but there. Some, but sometimes the choir are there in support, but don't always know all the notes. That's, so sometimes, <laughs> so some, so, That's a good so some, musical reference. I like that one. So some, I like that. So sometimes you need a, so, so sometimes you need a conductor. <laughs> Owen, Owen's, Owen's a music is, is a choir director. <laughs> so Owen, Owen's gonna laugh, but he's a choir so director. He like that. You need a conductor to lead, and that's what we're here today. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Kaz, I saw you with your hand up real quick. Um, uh, something you want to add? And also, I just also want to ask about, maybe you can answer this, because I don't want this to go around the room. I just need one answer in regards to, like, 
um because it kind of was we kind of talked about it in a little bit about the need of like uh uh, uh training right and what that look I, I would love to hear from somebody who can really talk about the importance of succession and retention and getting into the door and what that actually looks like like we all might think it sounds very common sense but it has to be projected in this room right now um you mean like lifting each other up? You know what I'm saying? No, within with Ian, break it down for her. I saw you shake okay. your hand. <laughs> yeah, so, so I mean, mm. um, we we kind of jumped to succession and retention, but mm. um, so if we're gonna jump there, um, you know, the role of education, yeah, um, mentorship, succession planning, like, like you know, to Delvina's point, like we need to start at age five. Do mm -hmm. we? Do kids in the East Coast know that there is a position called video director? Mm -hmm. you know, black woman right do the kid yeah all of that stuff you know, needs to um, happen so planning succession planning and the creation of the next generation of black music professionals in the east coast this goes to hiring this goes to hiring practices it goes to professional advancement it goes to promotion it goes to boards of directors etc cetera, etc cetera. so we'll do that and then we're going to go into a speed round and and uh, everybody's and end. their final questions we won't have room. We won't have room. Final, for final statement. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Cass. Um, I had a point and totally just made me education, mentorship, it. succession. Plan. Yeah, well, it's education, mentorship. It's all necessary, but again, I think that um, one people start considering these things way too late. You know, like mm -hmm. they start, they start looking at teenagers about to graduate out of high school, you know, and start thinking, oh, we need to give them programs. We need to give them mentorship. We probably already late by that time. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the average 16, 17, 18 year old, like they're, they're set in their ways and it's a harder, it's a harder task for you at that point. You know what I'm saying? It needs to start earlier than that, because like you said, these kids don't, don't know that these things exist plain and simple. I wanted to become a filmmaker simply because I was obsessed with watching MTV's behind the video. <laughs> and I didn't care about the artist. Well, I did, the reason I watched it because I cared about the artist. I grew up wanting to be the star, right? But I'm an introverted, you know what I mean? I'm shy. And so being in the front just wasn't conducive to my personality. You know what I'm saying? But I watched making the video because of the star, but then I was amazed by all these people. There was so much commotion going on and this, that, and the third. And I just thought, wow. And then they created this magic, which was the music video. And I just said, I want to do that. That was it. Didn't know what it was, but I just said, I want to do that. And that was like young, like nine, 10, 11 years old. It wasn't until I was 16 when my grade 12 English teacher put a camera in my hand for the first time. And I realized, oh, this is how they do it. You know what I mean? And I was lucky enough, like my mind was straight. So I set on a path. Right. But it's like, imagine if I hadn't known what all those people did when I was eight, nine, 10 years old, you know, and people think that because I work, I make, I used to make music videos. People still come in music, um, a music producer. I don't produce beats. <laughs> Never have. You know what I mean? Like, you know, people don't, or then I'm a movie producer. No, I have producers that produce for me. Like most people don't know even what a director does. People don't realize that a director never touches a camera. That's a cinematographer's job. You know what I mean? Like kids don't know that, like even in the film world, like people, most people, uh, I'm gonna be quick. Most people skip all the credits, right? I sit there and I watch all the credits and you guys know, cause I respect all those people. They don't know that one name. There's a man that sits there and pulls the focus on awesome. the camera. They're called yeah. the focus puller. Their job is to just make sure that the lens is in focus. They don't move the camera. They don't put the lights. They literally just stand there and make sure the shit is in focus. They make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just from doing that. Kids don't know that exists. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Don't forget the key grip. Yep. The key grip, you <laughs> know what I mean? Grips, yeah, the grips, yep. the gaffer, but that's what I'm saying. All those yep. people in that movie that made a Transformers movie, they all made a bang. I guarantee you that. You know what and, I mean? But those kids don't know this the, exists. And it's the same in the music industry. The music it's the same industry, in the music industry. You, exactly. have, you have mixers, you have producers, you have uh, accountants, you have business accountants, you have you know, attorneys, you have promoters, you have booking agents, you have uh, road tour managers. There's all these different spaces that we can fill, but we need to be able to go into the communities and actually educate from an early mm -hmm. stage and mentor all the way up to getting them the actual job. And mm -hmm. the industry has to understand that we are hard workers. The black Most of these kids think are, the only way know? to see the world is to be the superstar, to be the artist. You know what I mean? The movie star, the singer, all that. 
the stage manager, the roadie, the grip, all these people, they travel in and see in the world too and live an experience that half the people on this planet would never experience, right? But it's because, like you said, it doesn't matter what it's the music industry, all of that, but people don't know it exists because no one's out there teaching any of these kids that these things do exist. They just show them like, oh, you're never gonna be fucking Justin Bieber because you're a little black boy from North Preston. You know what I mean? Yep. But that's not true, you know? And maybe if you're not Justin Bieber because you don't sing good, but you could be Justin Bieber's manager, the next Justin Bieber's manager, or so on and so forth. There's so many things out there. Justin Scooter, Bieber's accountant. Scooter Brown. <laughs> yeah, you could be Scooter right. Brown. Like you said, the accountant. You know how much money Justin Bieber's accountant is making and Bieber's making $80 million a year? Come we on. Gotta, we got we to gotta jump, but um, I want to... I wanna, um, two quick points I want to make. Um, one that comes off the back of Kaz, which is Black people can be hired in all areas, not just what you deem to be black music areas. Graphic designers can design for rock artists. They can design for hip hop artists. They can design, accountants can do accounting for rock artists, jazz artists, R&B artists, gospel artists, folk artists, reggae artists, reggaeton artists, everything. Second point, um, and this is one that is not in the notes, but I wanna to speak to the ladies here uh, because I believe that the revolution is led by black women. Every space um, that, we are able to move into as black people is pioneered by black women. I want you three to speak quickly on the importance of the black woman in the East Coast in leading the charge, please. Rini? I'll go first. Go ahead, Rini. Um, I, I will say that um, black women in Nova Scotia are very powerful. And we have one of the most powerful on the panel um uh the OG uh, <laughs> the OG um and you know I, it's great that we have people like her especially for myself because she's the role model for me as a young musician coming up in Nova Scotia um and I think um our voice sometimes almost can become a little bit lost in a sense um and that's come from two places one from a systemic racism factor and also toxic masculinity. So um, I know for myself, anytime I'm in a position where I'm the only black female, I come in with the chip on my shoulder and I'll, I make it a point to prove whether it's the truth or not that I'm the smartest person in that room. Um, and I try to lead with my actions and also with what knowledge I, I can bring. And I think for, for myself, I've kind of um, made that known in the groups, and I've 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 earned respect in that in that in those settings. And I think I'm coming into a place where I'm being known more so as a leader. And um, I think it's really important because I know for me, I'm all about community, um, and I'm all all about you know the next generation. I have a younger sister, um, so for me, it's important to to show how powerful black women can be. And like I said, I had some great role models and people who've come before me to kind of show me and, and uh, show me the right way to go. And it's, it's great to, to see how, how prominent black voices, especially black female voices have such an impact um, on the younger generation, like, like myself. Thank you, Kaz. I know you have to leave soon here. Um, we're getting on two o'clock here and, and yeah, yeah, we're gonna is going. So maybe you can also shed light on the question that, that Ian had, but also end it with uh, a, sol like a, a, a solution that you would like to see that you feel would m make the most impact in the changes that we've been talking about here today or the, the areas that we feel like we need change in. You're muted. For me, I guess it all kind of ties in together is um, I, my mandate is just, I want to see more black women um, doing all of these things, you know, uh, every time I'm in Halifax, I try to show, you know, have conversations and dialogue with just the young black females in particular, because um, I find that so much focus on, on any of these things, especially when it comes to youth and stuff, it's all about like, it's all about, about masculinity and it's about focus on the boys. And especially when it comes to the black community, um, it's all about, you know, we gotta help these young black men. We gotta help these young black boys. But you know, the young black females need to know that they can do these things too. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's my goal. Like, 
to this day, people think that if you don't know who I am, people think I'm the stylist, the makeup artist, this, that, and the third, you know what I mean? Even from black women, you know? And then, and, and it hurts me the most coming from them, but I don't fault them because we're taught no better than that. You know what I'm saying? And then, but then they're like, wow, you're the director and that, that, that look in their eyes. And it's like, it's nothing about me. It's just, it makes me, they're like, I can actually freaking do that. You know what I mean? Like, Wow, you know, and and that's always my goal because, um, like Arini was saying, like there's there's nothing more powerful than the strength and resilience of the black woman, and no movement in anything succeeds without the female voice, plain and simple. You know what I mean? That's facts. Again, like um, Ian was saying, check Google if you don't believe me, any global movement of anything on this world. And that goes beyond the black movement. It, it, there's no movement that wasn't affected or successful without the voice of the woman. So that's just that. Um, for me, what I'll say is my final words is um, uh, my biggest issue with down home is there's still so much division, you guys. Like we were saying, like you can be, just cause you're an accountant don't mean you gotta be an accountant for just the black stuff. Go be an accountant for a folk artist, but vice versa. You know what I mean? Just cause you're a manager, like there's too much this and that. Like it's not 1957 no more, you guys. You know what I mean? And when I go down home, it's like stepping into a time warp and I go down home frequently. Everybody knows this, even though I'm based out of Toronto and I'm still active in my community. And I'm tired of just seeing that division on both ends. Like stop all that it's 2021 you know what i mean and we're never going to get anywhere especially being so small if we keep that division plain and simple we need to do for us yes black people but we also need to not be so close when to the um the non-black people that are trying to help our help our mission and grow too you know what i mean so that's all thank, i got to say thank you mm. yeah um i would just say a few words about the you know black women uh, that's that's a very important part of, of this whole conversation. We know Black women's, our womanhood, our personage has always been devalued in society. So we come at this with a disadvantage already. We know that in the music industry, um, and even before that, we gotta look at the fact we, we have the triple jeopardy. We're not only Black and from economically sort of uh, under, underrepresented communities, or underprivileged communities, but we're also female. So you get the, the class, the race, and the gender all, you know, sort of steaming against you. Um, and that within the music industry, there's been a complete, you know, history, decades history of Black women being treated like empty vessels who are supposed to just show up and sing the songs that a man wrote for them, etc. who are supposed to do the choreographed moves that were meant for them, who are supposed to just be somebody's backup singers, but not supposed to have you know, uh, authentic leadership and be the songwriters, the singers, the arrangers. And those women are all history, are all hidden in black music history, hidden by, as Rini said, the toxic masculinity of the music industry and even within our own community. So, you know, I've spent my entire time, like, you know, in this music industry, helping all, lifting up all, but in particular, really focusing on black women in the work that I've created and trying to leave a legacy for black women to, to look up to as what we could do as Portia White left a legacy for me, then I see us leaving a legacy for the Reenies, the Zamanis, the Jody, Jody Upshaws, et cetera. And um, we have for the last five years been doing an event called Young, Gifted and Black. For the last five years, we take young black women and get them to learn to, meet, to sing jazz music because that's the history and the, and, the, and the core of black women's strength has come out of that community. And while we have come out of the church and we are largely vocalists, we're more than that. We're musicians and we are uh, producers, etc. So when I see young women like Rini and Zamani who go behind the board and they create their music and they mix it they can master it and they can do all that. So for me, I'd love to see us put some more investment into young women in the studio, to have an, an initiative of young black women uh, in the studio creating their music because the interface between the engineer and the, and, and the person who is doing that, you know, the producer and how the music sounds is very, very, very uh, significant. And a lot of times that male talks toxicity, uh, masculinity, the women will get in the studio and the, and the men will mystify everything that's happening so people don't get what they want. It's like, oh, this is so, it's kind of right. like, you know, how women can cook in the kitchen, but when you go outside to the back step and there's a big barbecue, sit back. I, I decide, I'm doing the barbecuing. It's like the men are doing the barbecue and it's still cooking. 
So women can't, you know what I mean? So they decide what time the food gets ready. Oh, they got to baste it a little bit more. It's like, wow, wow, wow. So right. I just think we need that. We need a program for young black women to become music uh, studio engineers and show that part, like how young women like Rini and Zmani and a few others, I think Quento too, are also dabbling into that. And we we, we need to support them because I think that they would produce something very different. Do you have a, what's the name of that again? Just so that if any funders are here, see that come across their desk, they know what it That's is. That's right. <laughs> An initiative, exactly. You hear, I hope you're here. Mickey, are you listening? We need a program to absolutely, to take 10, take a cohort of say, you know, 10 or so, it doesn't have to be What's that big. Do you have a name for it? Oh, the Young Gifted and Black? Okay, great. There we could you make go. It, we could make it, we could make it a part of Young Gifted and Black, an expansion of Young Gifted and Black. Absolutely. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. Oh. So we're gonna we're gonna um, wrap because we're at exactly the two hour mark. Um, but I'm going to uh, throw to each one of you. Um, we have talked about dedicated spaces. We've talked about artists and festivals and, uh, and festivals needing to uh, allow the, us in in all spaces. Uh, we've talked about uh, something that Delvina um, spoke about, which is calling it by its name. This is a conversation on anti-Blackness and we are Black, and this is about Black music. Um, it is not a bad word and it is not a swear word. Uh, <laughs> we talked about uh, the need for siloed funding um, for all of these kind of programs like Young Gifted and Black, programs Corey and Delvina and uh, Owen are all involved in. Um, and, uh, and the one thing that we didn't really get to touch on uh, that's very important is the development money for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial spaces and places and development for business professionals. Um, so I'm going to throw to each one of you um, one at a time. And I'm going to ask you to, uh, <laughs> Mickey has come on stage. Uh, I'm going to ask each one of you to, uh, to tell me the greatest impediment to, uh, to Black music professionals in the East Coast, from your opinion, and what you need to see done. Go. Uh, Rini. Um, what, what I would love to see um, immediately is uh, our Black communities uh, to stop being demonized and also looking at those of us who come out of the community and to the forefront stop looking at us as charity cases for one we're not charity cases we don't want to be seen as that we want to be seen for our talent um, and be recognized as artists like everybody else um, and moving moving forward I'm I'm looking for organizations to step up and give opportunity and like I said not based on some type of charity case not based on keeping the masses quiet you know we want to see inclusion for the right reasons because there's talented people out there who deserve an opportunity um and i'll just leave it at that perfect i'm going to go to corey i want i just want to see representation all across the board when i turn on the tv look at welcome to nova scotia commercials when i go you know what i mean when i look at you know, like event, events going on, panels, all this. I just want to see representation and equal representation, not a token, because I don't like the token makes me not even want to attend events. And you know what I mean? I see that as like, oh, OK, I know why that's done. That's just like, OK, you got a group of people in a movie, you know, you got the black guy and it's a scary movie. You know, they're dying first. So it's like, it's just predictable. It's like, no, and it turns me off. I just want to see representation from the bottom to the top. And ACMC is down to collab with all hands, straight up. Which, which actually brings me to a quick point before I jump to the next um, speaker, um, which is that I want to issue an open invitation to the East Coast Music Awards and uh, the association and to the entire coast uh, to bring these black organizations to the table alongside us um, for the future uh, events. Um, so that's, uh, you know, Corey and Delvina's um, organizations, as well as all the other black organizations that we can find across the region to the table. Uh, Owen, biggest uh, impediment and what you would like to see done. Uh, from my perspective, I, I just want to say that what, what 
what a lot of the organizations need to understand is that black people here suffer real trauma from segregation that is still prevalent today so it's not enough to just say that your doors are open it's not enough to just say hey we're here we need you to get out of your office space and familiarize yourself with the black communities visit these communities visit north preston visit upper hammond's plains visit cherry brook create actual relationships with the black artists and the community so that you could better understand exactly what it is we need and exactly what type of initiatives that we're trying to implement rather than just saying well the, the doors open come in whenever you feel like it so what i would like to see are genuine relationships formed between the east coast music association music nova scotia african nova scotia music association um, and all the other organizations and communities within this province and within the Maritimes. Straight up. Oh, Davina. Yeah, well, I mean, to me, the thing that has to happen, I just put it out there again, is investment, 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 in terms of the uh, barrier and what has to change. We have to change that. The We see that we want to have, we see right now we're spending a lot of money on STEM, science, technology, edu you know, engineering and math. If we want to have doctors 10 years from now, all these STEM programs are in high school right now. And we've been doing that in the black community. And now we're finally getting our first doctors and dentists coming out, we invested in it then. We have to do the same thing in music. We have to take these folks at the junior high level, put that into them just like we do with STEM to get them towards music education so they can read music, just write music, you know, produce music. Uh, manage music, be business people there. You mentioned entrepreneurship that we hadn't touched that. I think organizations like the African Nova Scotia Music Association should absolutely be present and jump on that. When I think that when Mark Perry and myself really pioneered that in the early day, that uh, the very first uh, event we had to establish it was funded by the Black Business Initiative. So there's been that history already of, of uh, ANSMA having that connection to the entrepreneur world, and we just need to rekindle those kinds of things. And the same could happen with the work that Corey is doing or the Young, Gifted, and Black. So I think those are the three large sort of like operating entities of the Young, Gifted, and Black entity mindset, the African Nova Scotia Music Association, the group that Corey is working with as well to come to the table to create that infrastructure that we need around entrepreneurship. And I would say the other thing we need, and, and Owen spoke to it very eloquently, is the allyship with those who, like by going out into our communities, learn the history, learn the African Nova Scotian, African Canadian, African East Coast music history. Um, and that goes for us too, so that because if we don't know our history, we're bound to repeat the mistakes of the past. So we need to know our history. And for the listeners on here from the African Canadian community in terms of what we need to do, because it's a, it's a duality, it's a dyad, right? There's things that we're asking those who are empowered to do, and there's things in our community that we need to do. As musicians, artists, entrepreneurs, stand on the principle of Black excellence. Always, always stand on the principle of Black excellence. Take advantage of all the opportunities to develop yourself. Invest in yourself financially and with your time. Don't cry in your soup, but no one's helping if you don't invest in you first. If you don't value yourself, no one's going to value you. Be a professional in all that you do. And like myself, and I see it happening with everybody on this panel, lift as you climb. I see Rini helping my daughter. I see Owen helping her. I see her helping ones coming by and her, the 14 year olds that are in Young, Gifted and Black. Lift as you climb. And as I say, the last thing I'm gonna say is that in this business or like any business, and this comes way out of what we've talked about already, although Rini talked about it somewhat, I know we all are there, is that you have to have some groundings and a spiritual practice of some sort. It doesn't mean you have to go to church. It doesn't mean you have to you know, pray to it, but you have to have something that grounds you because this community, this industry can change you. And sometimes it can change you not for the better. So you want to be, be your authentic self, find some kind of a practice that grounds you so that you have a bigger reason for being involved in the music industry than just to make money or just to be on the map or just to be in front of a camera. Find a spiritual groundings about doing, making, 
Don't be in it to make just a living. Be in it to make a difference. Change the world. Thank you. Thank you. With that, and let me grab uh, Sorry, go ahead, Clark. Sorry. Um, I just would like to say thank you to all of, all of you for being with us today. And, and Kaz, I know you're not with us, but, but thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I just wanted to add to everybody that that has attended today, thank you so much for being here and listening and, and also realize that it's not easy to, to tell these truths. It's very exhausting. It's painful. And um, for the change that we want to see does not fall on our shoulders. It falls on all of our shoulders. And so what does that mean? How do we hold this? This, this what you're seeing here is not a performative thing. This is not us here to talk about our trials and tribulations and all that shit. <laughs> it's actually here to say, how do we actually make a difference? And that starts with each and one of us in this room right now, holding each other accountable, holding each other and, and not expecting us to, to do the work for ourselves, but together we can actually make an industry be more diverse and, and uphold a, a very, very equitable and, and actually very um, successful industry when we're all in it together. And that's just, you know, I, I wanna thank ECMAs for, for this opportunity for us doing this. And I encourage if none of you have checked out www.bdrb.ca, please check out the declaration that we've created. Please sign it. Make sure that if you work for a company that they sign it. <laughs> Make sure that your boss is like, hey, if you wanna, if you wanna be in the, what I see as the industry is where I wanna see it, then you need to sign this. And, uh, and then if you see somebody who signed something who ain't doing what they say they're going to do, knock on their door and say, yo, step your shit up. Do you know what I'm saying? So um, thank you, everybody. Um, Ian. Yep. So just some housekeeping. Uh, thank you to the East Coast Music Association, um, to SEMA, uh, to TD, um, CB Mike, um, Manito uh, um, Music Organizations, uh, Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland, and New Brunswick. And uh, this has been Breaking Down Racial Barriers. As Click said, please log on to www.bdrb.ca and to my Black people, uh, Nova Scotia, emancipate yourselves from mental uh, slavery. None but us can, uh, can free our minds. Um, you know, Marcus Garvey on, on your land. All right, this has been Breaking Down Racial Barriers. Thank you guys so much. And uh, look out for episodes two, three, and four coming up with other members of the East Coast in the coming months. Um, and then uh, some final thoughts uh, written into a document. Okay, this has been Breaking Down Racial Barriers. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.